Welcome to Module 8, the final module in this ethnomedicine course, The Future of Traditional Tribal Healing in Medicine. There will be two modules here. The first will be a discussion of Han Chapter 10, From Medical Anthropology to Anthropological Medicine. And then finally I'll do a sort of summary and concluding thoughts video after this one. Okay, well first I want to direct your attention to a quote on page 262 from a Navajo medicine man. And really it's a, it's a nice summary of ethnomedical practices, I think. And here's what he says. You can read along with me on page 262. As I see it, all the diseases which hurt the Navajo people may be divided into three kinds. There are those diseases that we medicine men have given up on. We know that you white doctors have better cures than we do. One of the diseases of that sort is tuberculosis. Then there is sickness which comes from getting too close to where lightning has struck. Right now there are probably some patients in this hospital who are sick from that illness and you doctors have no way of even finding out what is wrong with them. But we medicine men can and we are able to cure such cases. A third type of illness is snake bite. You can cure that, and we Navajo also have our own medicines for that. So that pretty much covers the gamut, I think, of ethnomedical healing. Three different categories there, and one category, as the last one I mentioned, the snake bites, this would be, would cover such things as uh, stomach aches and headaches and burns and broken bones and, and uh, th things of that nature that, that everyone can deal with and they can deal with quite well. And then there are some that are beyond their capacity to deal with because of the lack of, of medicine and, and technology and so forth. He mentions tuberculosis. And then finally there's that third category of more cultural type sickness. And in his case he gave us an example of people being too close to where lightning has struck. As you've seen though, in a number of different cultures, uh, there are cultural maladies that are pretty much produced uh, and generated by that culture which you may not find anywhere else. According to Han, anthropological medicine can be described by alluding to four basic points. Number one, anthropological medicine is aware of the socio-cultural roots of both Western and ethnomedical notions of healing and sickness. No form of medicine is strictly empirical and strictly acultural as we've seen. All forms of medicine, even Western biomedicine, uh, has some cultural slash symbolic aspects to it, although it is true that Western biomedicine is probably the least cultural and the least symbolic and the most empirical of the different forms of medicine out there. Secondly, anthropological medicine recognizes that the etiology of sickness can be found in socio-cultural, physiological, and environmental conditions. Uh, so uh, we're also, I guess from the perspective of anthropology, we're not healing just the cell, but we're also concerned about the soul, quote unquote, the cultural being, the spiritual being. As we have seen, context, cultural context, can certainly affect sickness. Also, ideology affects sickness and healing. Uh, for example, go to China where sickness is often attributed to a cosmic imbalance uh, between the yin and the yang. You don't actually find that perspective anywhere else. Uh, Christian scientists see sickness as being a spiritual issue, etc. So we can see that ideology and cultural context greatly affect sickness. Thirdly, anthropological medicine is aware of the effect that the socio-cultural context may have on therapy and healing. So for example, consider the malady of voodoo death that exists in Australia that you really won't find anywhere else. Some people are in fact exposed to certain issues just by virtue of the socio-cultural context in which they live. Uh, consider poverty, socio-economic class, things of that nature. There are certainly dangerous places to live. There are places where people live where they don't have access to good health care. 
So social cultural context is important. And fourthly, anthropological medicine addresses the well-being of not only the patient, but also the healer. An important point Han makes here is that all medicine is cross-cultural. And what, he, what he's sort of alluding to here is the disparity between the healer's understanding of the world and healing and sickness and the patient's understanding of the world and healing and sickness. In fact, since we've talked about psychotherapeutic healing so much in this course, I'd like to make a point here. The efficacy of psychotherapeutic healing is a function of the difference between the worldviews of the patient and the healer. Uh, clearly, psychotherapeutic healing will not occur in those cases where the patient has zero confidence in the healer and does not even share the worldview of the healer. So for example, you can take your typical deliverance ministry exorcist from Oklahoma and set them down in New Delhi, India, and they will not be able to complete a single successful exorcism. So by all medicine is cross-cultural, he's referring not only to medicine in general, but also the patient and the healer. And really, if you think about it, even in our own culture, there's generally a vast socio-cultural gulf that separates the typical doctor and his or her patient. Although, I guess I should add, though, that in cases where psychotherapeutic healing is not an issue, that's probably not as relevant. Han then moves on to a discussion of the theory of anthropological medicine. And just a few points he makes here. Uh, sickness is a condition that is unwanted by the patient. And so that basically is how Han has defined sickness from the beginning of the text. It's a condition that's unwanted by the patient. The way an individual perceives of the sickness is greatly influenced by their socio-cultural context. So the point here being that a pathogen is necessary, but it's not sufficient to cause sickness. That depends on the individual and their ideology, enculturation, and so forth. So for example, consider mushroom poisoning, a point that was alluded to a couple of modules ago. An individual who accidentally stumbles upon poisonous mushrooms will proceed immediately to the hospital and consider themselves to be a victim of poisoning, whereas someone else consuming the very same mushroom and after a sort of psychoactive, psychedelic experience will enjoy the experience. So a pathogen is necessary for sickness, but it's not sufficient for sickness. There are other things going on, such as ideology, uh, expectation, and so forth. Another point he makes here under the theory of anthropological medicine is that the organization of societies determines to a great extent the nature and distribution of sickness and the utilization of medical resources. So in other words, sickness is a social as well as a natural event. Uh, after all, some people simply have access to better health care than others. That's a social issue. That's not a biological issue. Some individuals are better educated than others and know what to look out for and know how to take care of themselves. Then, of course, there's also support. Some, some individuals have access to a better support network than others. And then finally, healing is a socio-cultural as well as a biological process. So, in other words, beliefs and worldview can affect healing. Next, Han moves to a discussion of the practice of anthropological medicine. And so what does he mean by the practice of anthropological medicine? Well, he's not advocating necessarily the employment of anthropologists in hospitals and clinics and so forth, but rather the adoption of anthropological principles and practices by people working in hospitals and clinics. So what does that mean? Well, it means, for example, we should pay attention to things like ethnicity, ideology, religious background, and so forth. Yes, uh, we are all homo sapiens and we do all share basic fundamental physiological structures and so forth, but however, as we've seen, 
what's going on between people's ears can greatly affect sickness and healing. Another point that needs to be made, do our biomedical practices fit well in a native context? So might there be some issue, for example, with immunization? Or for that matter, women treating men? or men treating women? All of these things need to be taken into account. Next, Han discusses principles of anthropological medicine, and I'll mention a few. First, there's what he calls listening. Listening. In anthropology, there's a tradition of listening to the other. Uh, the other being uh, anyone of a different cultural background, religious background, etc. And in fact, that's how we collect our information as anthropologists. We do field work uh, and we sit down with the people we're working with and we listen to them. We let them talk and we pay attention to them. So the point is that we need to try to see the world from their point of view. Remember culture relativism. No one culture is thought to be the standard by which all other cultures are judged. And actually biomedicine could probably only benefit from this approach, so we should listen. Secondly, understanding the context is important. It's very important that the physician and the healer be aware of the socio-cultural context that has shaped the patient's ideology. In other words, to use an anthropological term, the healer must become an ethnographer. What is it about that person's life experiences that may be affecting uh, their perception of sickness? Number three, recognizing intra-ethnic variability. Regardless of the society, individuals differ greatly. Even within small, ostensibly homogeneous societies, there's still a great difference within groups. So we must not assume uh, that we're dealing with cookie-cutter individuals, so to speak. Each individual is unique unto themselves, and we must not forget that. Number four, Han alludes to what he refers to as explaining, translating, and brokering. Uh, it might be necessary, for example, for a healer or a physician to call in a quote-unquote translator or quote-unquote cultural broker in an effort to understand their patient. That may be someone from the society itself that is familiar with both Western ideologies and native ideologies, or it may be an anthropologist who specializes in that area, but whatever, the physician may need someone between themselves and their patient to help them understand the patient and the patient's worldviews. And this, by the way, goes far beyond just simply informed consent. Here, the, the healer is actually reaching out and trying to understand the patient on a totally different level than what is generally called for. And then finally, there's what Han refers to as respecting, responding, and accommodating. And he makes the point that if local customs and practices are not harmful, so if ethnomedical practices aren't harmful, then they should be respected and accommodated. And often the physician and healer can work with uh, the local ethnomedical practitioner. I think this is an important point because it does say, at least implicitly, that if we find there is a ethnomedical custom or practice that is harmful, then we should probably step in and politely try to guide them in another direction. Although, let me say that I think it would be somewhat unusual to find an ethnomedical practice that is not at least neutral, if not helpful. Because simply put, people tend not to do things that are counterproductive to their survival.